<laughs> Pardon me, I had to make sure that I switched the posters this time. That was supposed to be up during the Caligula review, cause, I don't know, swords. But I got distracted. Return to Boggy Creek is happy though, it got plenty of love in the background over the last few weeks. And I guess this poster goes along with Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, the third movie in the series fully established the chainsaw is Excalibur. Uh, enough of that dawdling, we have to get to the most important part of the review. The movie? Oh no, the poll results! Wow, this one was close. Sometimes there's already a clear winner during the first day and I can start taking a few notes. This time, Texas Chainsaw 2 stayed ahead for about the first seven days until it was going back and forth with Phantasm, sometimes being ahead, sometimes not, and sometimes being tied before Chainsaw finally won by just four votes. Madman Mars didn't stand a chance. Obviously, we listened to the warning of not saying the name of Madman Mars. But in true poll fashion, the dramedy still won the comments. It makes sense that Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 won. With the trailer of that new movie being released, people have Texas Chainsaw Massacre fever. I'm sure the feedback on that trailer was great. Try anything and you cancel, bro. Oh, okay, I haven't seen it yet, so maybe it's good, but puke! The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 is basically the movie that you kind of picture in your head when you hear the title, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's got a wild emphasis on gore, humor, and with an extra dose of canon films. Toby Hooper, the director of the original, was only going to produce this film at first, but returned as director when they couldn't afford to hire another one. With this sequel, he has a much heavier emphasis on black comedy, as opposed to the wildly disturbing nature of the original. Hell, you can tell that from the poster that parodies The Breakfast Club. You may think it was canon films that made it crazier, but no, they were actually upset that it was more of a comedy than the first one. But you don't need me to remind you of the first one. That's what the narration is for. On the afternoon of August 18th, 1973, five young people in a Volkswagen van ran out of gas. Then they got gas, went home, and lived happily ever after. Sorry, but I only trust the narration when done by John Larroquette, though there is still some important info here. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre has not stopped. It haunts Texas. It seems to have no end. Explains all the sequels, I guess. Chainsaw 2 came out in 1986, 12 whole years after the first. Guess that makes sense why I'm reviewing it years after I reviewed the first one. You can see that video over on our archive site. And writer L.M. Kit Carson is gonna make sure this movie is more graphic than the first. See, not a mailbox was spared in this massacre. Ah, good times. Being a college frat boy and driving around shooting shit in Texas. While listening to all the hits from DJ Stretch, played by the great Caroline Williams. Though later she may wish she wore the chop top and not ZZ Top shirt. I'm thinking this is another movie's universe too. LG is played by Lou Perryman and he was at the bar in the Blues Brothers. It has to be the same character. You can tell they're rich. They got a phone in their car. They can afford to get lost on their way to whatever 80s college shenanigans movie they're driving to. They're used to these kind of hijinks being resulted with a slap on the wrist from the man. Maybe these youngsters have a chance against the Sawyer family. I mean, they do have guns with them. Their high goes on so long they're still prank calling Stretch well into the night. And they'll continue to do so until she finally plays some Simply Red, goddammit. Sadly, they have messed with the wrong cannibals. I'm honestly surprised the family was able to stay hidden for this many years. They don't seem to be on the subtle and hiding in plain sight side this time around. Hell, the original script was even crazier, as it was going to be about a whole town of cannibals and called Beyond the Valley of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. These boys still have a few bullets left after putting 12 rounds into a speed limit sign. This is just like planes, trains, and automobiles. If John Candy really was Satan and Steve Martin got his head split with a chainsaw, all while being broadcast live on the radio. Whoa, they just cut off. 
And now here's Hell is for Children by Pat Benatar. I trust the case will get solved this time. Dennis Hopper plays Lieutenant Lefty. He's figured out quick that the cannibals are back and made glasses out of someone's eyes. Lefty is the uncle of Sally and Franklin from the first one, as the movie says. Yes, there's something about chainsaw killers, your brother's kids killed. But that was 14 years ago, sir, way down in South Texas. Thanks, Officer Exposition. I'll bet the narrator is his source. He tries telling Lefty it was just an accident, right? They obviously just hit a chainsaw-wielding deer. But two dead from a chainsaw calls for more partying. They're partying so hard, even the director is getting in on it. I freaking love Hopper. Leave it to him to still be great, even when he doesn't like the movie. At one point, he called this the worst movie he had been in, until later he said that that honor goes to Super Mario Brothers. And adding Caroline Williams makes it even better. This is my chance to stop playing headbanging music and do something real. Playing nothing but fine young cannibals. Despite the murders, this still looks like an appealing place to live. They got houses made of french fries, and even the whole state is dripping in chili. The winner of this chili cook-off is Drayton Sawyer. Oh, wait a minute. The cook, Jim Seedow. You can't fool me. That chili is made of people, and is probably delicious. The best part is you can shit it right back out in the trophy, and it would probably look the same. But seriously, there are still some rules in this town. Now be sure to watch your drinking and driving on this wild and woolly Texas OU weekend. Right? You might hit the wandering marching bands. You never know where they're gonna pop up. Here you just have to expect a chainsaw massacre to happen when you got shops dedicated to selling these things. They lost a lot of business after the passing of Farmer Vincent. He is preparing for the climax's epic chainsaw battle to the death. <laughs> but really, it'd probably be easier if you just shot them. It is a canon film. They of all people should know that Bronson could handle this family in five minutes. No matter how badass you handle a chainsaw. Uh. Oh sure, but when I chainsaw things like that, I lose four fingers. Lefty has a request for Stretch, which is to play that tape on the air again to lure in the killers. I don't think it'd be legal to do that. Ma'am, this town doesn't have laws, you know that. And when we come back, even more law breaking! In the town of Valentine Bluffs, <coughs> there are many ways to die. <coughs> Take your pick, my bloody Valentine. Rated R. Now that we're back, so many people are dead and turned into chili. Drayton did it again, aha, <laughs> number one. Number one. But at least he seems happy. And she plays Lefty's request, too. This is for Lefty. Excellent. I love Slayer. This angers Cook. He's more of a New Wave fan. I do like how, yeah, the movie is quite a bit more comedic, but the returning characters, like him, really aren't acting out of character from how they were in the first one. It's the added characters like Chop Top that really sends this into batshit dark comedy territory. Uh, I, I wanna, I wanna buy some, uh, radio ad time? Obviously for his button selling business. Chop Top is played by Bill Mosley, the Sonny Bono of people who scratch plates on their head with a wire hanger. This role makes up for the fact that he didn't say much of anything in Silent Night, Deadly Night 3. Something tells me he is not really a rock and roll fan, though. You know, like, uh, uh in a Vita de Gata, baby? <laughs> it's heavy! Ooh, I dare you to actually him. He's got a request, too. Hours and hours of horror comedy shtick. <laughs> She doesn't even need to ask. She just assumes he wants her to play Manson's Mechanical Man. But alas, here is the most important part of the movie. The part where we are fully caught up to the scene Tom Hanks was watching in The Burbs. And yes, seeing The Burbs in the theater was my first exposure to this movie. No one under 17 was allowed in the theater because it even gave poor Ray nightmares. And why not? Mosley is a force in this flick. Like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas if they got high off of having mad cow disease. 
Some people you just know aren't going to make it. Sorry, LG. This is why the character doesn't return for the sequel, Blues Brothers 2000. But the worst tragedy is, of course, that he killed the damn beer. The dialogue in this movie is just weird. It's great, but it's weird. How good are you? Don't bang, Leatherface. Of all the bizarre pornos I've seen, I'm surprised I didn't see one where someone has a chainsaw dick. This is the erotic chainsaw scene that Vim Vendas wouldn't let the writer use when he wrote that other Texas classic, Paris, Texas. But like everyone, once he gets it up, he just uses that dick to break things. It's really a love story at heart. He lets her live and tells Chop Top that she died. He's a big ol' softy after all. Obviously, Lefty is out fucking everything that moves. So she has to take care of this herself. She hangs back pretty far. That way they won't see her, and she won't hear Chop Top's endless rambling. Eventually, Lefty does show up to scare the hell out of her for a while before getting out of the car. <laughs> Sorry, we like ourselves a good fake out in Texas, and practical jokes, too. <laughs> this movie is starting to get a little strange. This is one mine car chase away from being Pancot Palace. Just kidding, she's in one of the awesome new haunted houses from the Matterhorn theme park in Prairie Dale, Texas, which is where the climax was filmed. No wonder we haven't seen the Sawyer family in 12 years. It took them that long to make this place the perfection that it is. And this guy is gonna come in and tear it all to pieces. I'm thinking he's got other plans besides killing them. Otherwise, a shotgun would have still been easier. Help me beat this stranger that walks beside me. It takes away my strength. Then again, his chainsaw is blessed by the Lord. Lefty must fight the Sawyer's subtlety with his own subtlety. Ah! Ah! By definitely giving away his location. It's even worse than he thought. Now he has to fine them for not taking down their Christmas decorations. It's February, you psychopaths. We may have a new name for this theme park, though. It's the Devil's Playground. Wrong 70s movie. Maybe chainsaws are the best weapons, as he's using them to bring it all down as he keeps screaming. Seems like a good idea in theory, but the climax of Paint Your Wagon told me that this will destroy the whole town. As for Stretch, she is praying she's just simply in the fancy basement of the Beverly Hillbillies. Big, big pregame brunch tomorrow means a ton of croissant sandwiches. Uh. See, it ain't so bad they're preparing for the Super Bowl party. The film continues to be the story of friendship and true love. But she does offend him by asking him for a Gunner Hansen autograph. No, you fool, it's Bill Johnson playing Leatherface this time. The moral of the movie is to stay away from Bill's, even if he tries wooing you by putting a face on your face. Uh, ew, I can tell that's LG's face. I can taste the chewing tobacco. Ugh. There is still some hope left for LG to have a faceless cameo in Blues Brothers 2000. <laughs> oh, never mind. He dies with a farewell. Ah, shit. She has many questions she needs answered. Like, is Chop Top the hitchhiker from the first one? It's what everyone asks. A metal plate in the head is getting off easy from this accident. Wait, no, no, Nubbin's the skeleton, that's the hitchhiker. Making Chop Top his twin brother. I can see the resemblance. Good thing she's still being quiet, though, when pondering these questions, unlike some people. Bring it on out! Bring it on out! Dude, shh. I feel like despite their cave house coming down around them, this place would still be very unsanitary. They're gonna need a tetanus shot like every day. They can do that while working on their comedy routines. Nah, booger! How big? Big crazy booger! Classic Charlie McCarthy. The Sawyers can't be the only returning characters, though. Look, he finds the skeletal remains of Franklin, still in his wheelchair. Franklin. Are you sure it's Franklin? <laughs> yep, it's Franklin. I'll give them a minute to catch up. And now it's time for Lloyd's Out of Context 911 Lone Star Clip of the Week, the Dream Sequence Edition. Because you need me to be the person to tell you this. Tell me what? 
stop it. Stop what? Dying. <laughs> yeah, stop dying, asshole. Welcome back, and is Dennis Hopper still being awesome? I'll take you back to hell! I'll take you to hell! Yes, yes he is. And he's having more fun too, still accidentally scaring the shit out of Stretch. You give Jason Voorhees an extra 12 years, and this is probably what remake Jason would have turned his cave into. Hell, I'm surprised this movie didn't have Driller Killer's warning of this movie must be played loud. This is way louder than a drill. But we can still hear them fighting like a rom-com couple. <laughs> Let's talk about it! Hmm, seems legit. They could use a romantic candlelight dinner to talk things out. What? They've already been dancing. And she is finally meeting his family. Unfortunately, she has to pretend to laugh at his brother's jokes. And it's awkward because Cook is just now giving Leatherface the sex talk. I'm sure this is going to be very accurate. You got one choice, boy. Sex or the saw? Those are the only choices? <laughs> Sex was rough in the 80s. But the saw, the saw is family. <laughs> Great, so if I bang the saw, it's incest? I do not like these options. Some familiar things happen, like them doing the dinner scene from the first one, only if it looked like it could have been on the set for Pirates of the Caribbean. Even Grandpa is brought back, who is now over 130 years old. This movie is selling me on the cannibal diet. I'll live into my hundreds and have an amazing castle. And for a strict liquid diet keeps him as fresh as a rose. <laughs> Wait, liquid diet? Never mind. I need my human Big Macs. This whole sequence is like the first one, only if you swapped out the actors with Jerry Lewis, Sammy Petrillo, Bad Grandpa, and Baby Huey. Not only do they deserve their chili trophy, they deserve an Oscar! They do the head bashing game again too, but they should be faster about it. Just saying, that food on the table is gonna get cold and they're gonna have to reheat it. It just doesn't taste the same coming out of the microwave. While this one is more comedic, it does still have some disturbing parts because that still looks like it's gotta hurt. But after being taken down by a truck of rednecks at the end of Easy Rider, Hopper has come better prepared this time. Boys, you never should have been doing this. At least not without the proper permits. It's hard to keep track of all of his lines in this. I'm the Lord of the Harvest. Because each one of them is greater than the last. So is Chainsaw 2 the best of the sequels? It ends with Dennis Hopper in a chainsaw battle with Leatherface, and despite some callbacks like the dinner and head bashing, it isn't completely doing the exact same thing as the first one, as it has a style and tone all of its own that's unique to just this one in the series. So yeah, it's the best of the sequels, as much as I love Crazy Robot Leg McConaughey. And while we have to say goodbye to Jim Seedow's last movie role, and poor Grandpa doesn't make it to the age of 140, Leatherface runs around with a chainsaw sticking through his gut, but he'll be fine. I'm sure even Hopper survived the explosion. Even Bill Mosley will be back, but, um, playing the Seedow role? <laughs> this series is confusing! Hell, I'm fairly certain some apocalyptic event has taken place outside while they were down there. If this is the stand, Chop Top can transition perfectly into being Trash Can Man. He's gotta pay for all of his slicing and dicing. He even chopped out the Joe Bob Briggs cameo, despite him being credited at the end. See? It is the stand! But in true Briggs fashion, he blamed it on Gorbachev. Damn right, he was also responsible for cutting the Harrison Ford cameo from E.T. So if the first one ended on one of the most iconic shots in horror movie history, by God, so does the second one. Sadly, she'll be no match for the stepfather. And that's the end of Toby Hooper Presents Rob Zombie's First Movie. The film is a blood-dripping smorgasbord of quotable lines, great set designs from Carrie White. Wait, Carrie White? I think there's a horror reference in there somewhere. And of course, the phenomenal effects by Tom Savini, who even called his makeup on Grandpa to be his proudest achievement. The movie got bad reviews, duh. 
but with a $4.5 million budget, it was able to make that back and also do gangbusters on home video, which, yeah, with a box cover like that, I'm renting the shit out of this movie. It's one of those great parody sequels that earns its cult movie status right along with others like Evil Dead 2 and Gremlins 2. The first one will always be my favorite for how it still has the power to scare the shit out of me. But the second is great for when you need to kick back with some drinks, a carton of cigarettes, a bowl of chili, and a belly of laughs. Coming up next week, no big boxes or pulls because it's Valentine's Day and we gotta continue on with the romance. But a bit bloody, of course. Good night. Good night. <laughs>